Um, I'd, I'd like to spend some time on 1 Corinthians 15, if you would do that, please. The Corinthian church, the Corinthian church, Paul began, Acts 18 has the record of it, when you want to read some of the background. He spent 18 months there with them. He entered the town frightened, very frightened, so frightened that the Lord, Acts 18, has to appear to him and tells him not to be afraid. But that there are a lot of people in that city that God knew would respond to the gospel. And so he did establish the church and that congregation broke his heart from the day that he established it until he went away. Uh, he speaks of them in chapter 1, 1 Corinthians 1, and says that they have come behind in no way short of knowledge and the blessing of God's grace and knowledge and giftedness. But they became enamored with their giftedness. They enjoyed the argument, a lot of philosophizing went on at Corinth, and uh, they liked the argument. So they began to argue about who was the leading a servant of God, Apollos maybe, Peter maybe, Paul maybe, and even Christ was viewed uh, as one of the leaders of a, a clique. Not a sect as such, but certainly um, cliques within the body. And uh, that's, that's how they ended up. And some years after Paul went away, one of the Clements um, describes the church about what, 150 years, I think, subsequent, that they were still that kind of a congregation. So they were ready to debate anything. Yes, there's the background. We're going now into a text, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. I'm declaring, he says, I'm declaring to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand. For all of their faults, they're still the church of God up to this point. They're still the church of God, and they're still standing in at the point he's writing, up until this point, they're standing in the gospel. Verse 2, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. I'm not interested in discussing uh, the, the possibility of one losing his way and losing his relationship with Christ and then experience an ultimate loss. It's too clear, it seems to me anyway, too clear in Scripture that you can belong to Christ and that you can then lose your way and ultimately reject him. I'm sure that's true, and to argue about it, not. Verse 3, I deliver to you, first of all, that is of importance, why, not the first thing he said, but importance, wise. I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received. Others had been teaching it. Others had been preaching it. Paul knew all about it. He was the fellow who was there 
administering to the killing, the legal killing of Stephen and all of that. And when he met Christ, Christ said, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. He was having trouble all along. And finally he met Christ and all of that that he had heard, all the gospeling that he had heard and all that he had heard in Stephen and that, uh, finally on the meeting with Christ, uh, he became then a Christian. Yeah a follower of the Christ and uh, a specially chosen minister of the word of Christ. And he said, I deliver to you first of all that which I also received. That is, he includes what he had heard and all of the teaching about the resurrection of Christ. But that, of course, is in addition to his own personal meeting, which he speaks of shortly. He said, I deliver to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. The important phrase, they're all important, but the point he wants to make here is stressed in according to the scriptures. It was a serious problem with the Jews and the Gentiles who would have been influenced by the Jews in the synagogues that Jesus shouldn't have died, he was the Messiah. That was the big issue. To say that Christ died was an insult. Paul says early in 1 Corinthians, it was an insult to the Jew. It was stupidity to the Gentiles is what he said. And so when he headed to Corinth, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he said, before I got to you, I'd made, this is 1 Corinthians 2, 1, he said, I'd made up my mind that I was going to say nothing but Christ crucified. Now, that's not all he meant to say. The wording looks that way, but you must permit him to have his specific point. The thing that he would have to hammer home that would offend both groups at Corinth would be the death of Christ. And that's why I want to focus on that. But in this text, you can see that while he was there, he said, I taught you for 18 months what was most important, and he mentions the resurrection of Christ. And he makes the point that the resurrection of Christ was not a happenstance. It was according to the scriptures. He learned this not only from the Bible, from the Holy Spirit superintending his study and his reflection and his teaching. He learned it also from his own experience. But he wants to make the point that it's according to the scriptures. He'll do the same thing in a moment. Verse 4, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. It's important for him to make the point that, as Peter says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22, Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man chosen by God. I've lost how the text goes. A man who God anointed and he uh, spoke and bore witness to him through miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, of which you are all witnesses. And then the phrase I'm after, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. That phrase is intended to, and, and he does it in the text. He said, Jesus didn't die by accident. It was appointed by God. It didn't just, well, God wanted him to come into the world and look what they did to him, you know, and it was all sort of a chance thing. There's nothing chance about it. He learned it too about the others, like the two fellows on the road to a mass and a host of others. 
They met him on the road to Emmaus. They were talking. They were all down in the mouth. Christ said to them, what's got you down in the mouth? They said, you must be a stranger, a prophet, Jesus of Nazareth. And he was a prophet. He called himself a prophet, but he was more than that. He said, they said, he, um, he was a prophet of God, anointed and all of that. He did all these miracles and that, but they took him and they killed him. And we were hoping, uses an imperfect tense, we kept on hoping that this would be the Messiah, but, you know, they killed him. And then he said, they said, we heard from the women that, he was alive, but you know how it is. And then Jesus rebukes them and said, fools, slow of heart to believe all that the prophet said should happen. The Messiah must suffer and then be raised from the dead and be glorified. That's that's Luke chapter 24, 22 and following. And then he takes it up again in 44 and says the same, only more, says the same kind of thing. All that has happened to me, he said, that's the Moses and the prophets and the writings. The entire Old Testament is witness, not only to my incarnation, not only to my life, but to my suffering and my resurrection and glorification. And back at 1 Corinthians 15, Verse 5, he was seen by Kephas. There's no K in Greek, is there? Um, he was seen by Kephas, then by the twelve. After that, over 500 at once saw him. Greater part of them are still alive, but some have died. After that, he was seen by James, then all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, by one born out of due time. Look, he's insisting and proving, and I've got all these witnesses that Jesus Christ rose from the dead because he's going to deal with it shortly when he talks about some among them was, were teaching that the resurrection of the dead didn't happen, couldn't happen, wouldn't happen. So he's making the whole point here. Not only did Christ die according to the scriptures, but he was raised according to the scriptures. And not only did the scriptures say he would be raised, not only did he say he would be raised, people saw him. And then he says, so did I. In verse uh, 7, after that, he was seen by James and all the apostles. Then last of all, verse 8, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. Nine months, the baby is to be delivered. I wasn't born in nine months, as the metaphor goes. I was longer in being born. And then he says, I was the least Nine, for I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. This is an interesting confession. He will say in another text, let me tell you what I do. One thing I do, I leave the past behind and I press forward toward. And he meant every word of what he said then, but you can tell the truth under some sets of circumstances, and it's true. This is what I purpose and is what I do. And then every now and again, it comes to him. He will say the same thing in Ephesians chapter 3. He will say things like that. He will say in Galatians, I persecuted the church of God as he closes out chapter 1 there. Okay? So, he said, I'm the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called one because I persecuted the church of God. See that church of God? That is repeated, the church is repeatedly called. I think there are about seven times it's called the church of God. Do you know that the universal church in the New Testament is not called the church of Christ? I'm not opposed to the church of Christ name, you understand. It's a good one. But it's called the Church of God throughout the New Testament, and it's called the Churches of Christ. There in Romans 16, 16, he's speaking about congregations of Christ, a straight genitive. 
These are congregation assemblies of Christ. And the assemblies of Christ, like this one right here and now, this assembly right here, makes the living Christ concretely present. Christ is making himself present in you. This moment, people looking at you, looking at you, the living Christ, if they knew, if they knew and understood, they would see that you are Christ making himself present. Well, no, you mean we're the body of Christ. Yes, oh, of course I do mean that. And Paul will speak of that, but that's not what he says in 1 Corinthians 6. He said, you are parts of Christ. He drops the body metaphor there. And he says in uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 17, that those who are united with Christ are one spirit. You are Christ, not in any physical, mystical way, but Christ is indwelling you and makes himself present in you. And that's what Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 16, 16. The churches, the assemblies of Christ, wherever they are, you see, and the ones in particular that he knows throughout Asia, the, pro the Roman province, they're all saying hello to you, he says. Throughout, he will speak of the church of God, and then he will speak of the church of God in Christ to the Thessalonians. I'm back at 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to try hurrying through this as much as we can get, and then you can, we take over the, somebody better tell me when I've got five minutes with Linda not being here, okay? Uh, verse 10, but in spite of all of that, by the grace of God, I am what I am. It's great. Now, if you can preach at all, you can preach on that, can't you? But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. That implies if it was impossible to take it in vain, he couldn't say that, could he? It's possible to receive the grace of God in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. That sounds arrogant, doesn't it? But get his setting here, all right? If you went into Second Corinthians, it's in First Corinthians also. But if you go into Second Corinthians, you hear them talking about the interlopers, the bad eggs that come in to steal his work and he upset everything that he has been doing. He um, is not bragging. He's making the point to them, the Corinthians, I worked harder than all of them. Whether that he's talking about getting around and dealing with the legitimate 12 apostolic group or these fake guys that he will mention again. There's another thing for you to decide, all right? Um, he said, I labored more abundantly than the y'all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Verse 11, therefore, whether it was I or they, the apostolic group, the faithful job, so we preach and so you believed. There are those who like to make Paul and the whole apostolic group his kind of enemies and opponents. Now, he's not slow on rebuking Peter publicly and his close ally Barnabas. He calls the both of them hypocrites in Galatians 2, but that's only under these tough, bad circumstances when heretics are denying the salvation work of Jesus Christ among the Gentiles, saying you have to be a Jew in order to be saved. Acts 15, verse 1, Paul said, that's a rotten lie. And Peter and Barnabas buckled under the pressure of those nationalists who were heretical. So Paul climbed all over them. But he's not mad at the apostolic group. He goes up to Jerusalem and everything aside from that that I just mentioned is fine. Verse 12, verse 12. Verse 12. 
here's what he really wants to get at. Well, he wants to get at the, what we just went through, but here is the big issue that we're, for the moment, wanting to get at. Verse 12, now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how does some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Not everybody did, but some of you did. And their argument about how it can happen is mentioned later on, at least it's strongly hinted at later on. They want to know, well, you're dead, what? You come up out of the ground all like one of these, the walking dead and all that kind of muck. Whether that's the whole story or not is another question. We're not interested in but this. If Christ is preached, that has been raised from the dead, how does some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? 13, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. How many things go wrong if Christ is not risen? How many things go wrong? I glance at How many things can go wrong if Christ is not risen? You can make your own list. You may be interested in doing this because I'd maybe like to stay in 1 Corinthians if God enables us all to get back together in January. Uh, at least you think about it anyway. Eh? Here, how many things go wrong if Christ is not resurrected? You can start your list. He says in verse 15, uh, make it 14, if Christ is not risen, then our, you, our preaching is empty, fatuous, useless, ineffective for anything. And your faith is the same thing. You see all that faith? You committed yourself to him and you did all of that. And you did all the study and all the rest of that. He said all of that was nothing. And our preaching was nothing. Now that, those two big things are bad enough. But he then says, 15, yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. They weren't denying the resurrection of Christ. They were denying that the dead don't rise. And Paul is saying, if what some of you are saying is true, it follows Christ didn't rise. And if Christ did not rise, you see all the stuff that we've been saying? People like me, he would say. Peter, all the 500, all James, all of these people, we've all been saying we saw him alive after he was dead. Liars, he said, is what we are. Not only are we liars, but we are lying in the name of God. For we said, God raised him from the dead. And God led us. Verse 15, 16. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. There is no nothing ahead. And he drives at home. And when he says, um, verse 17, if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Listen, no one can take away the death of the Lord Jesus Christ for pity's sake. No one can take away the death of Jesus Christ for our sins. It's what he said up in 15, verse 3. Christ died for who pair there means 
on behalf of, to deal with, for the sake of. It, it, it's one of those wide-ranging prepositions. But he died to deal with our sins. He didn't die to help sin. He died to annul it. He died to take care. So Christ didn't just die. You look at him, you see him hanging on the cross. You know the fact of his dying. But you don't know the purpose of his dying unless you have grounds for that. And we have grounds for it. Not only the whole Old Testament, not only Paul's doctrine and all the gospel uh, church, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ back in the day, talking about forgiveness of sins and reconciliation and all, all the different words that speak of different aspects of our salvation. Salvation is a great word. It's not big enough to tell the whole story. Forgiveness of sins is a massive phrase, but it's not big enough to tell us about all the truth. We need all these different words to see the different angles. We shouldn't make our gospel all one word. For we're devaluing our theological and gospel language. Justification is a different word than reconciliation. Forgiveness is a different word than cleansing. And on and on and on. There are all these words in here. And you can look at Christ's sacrifice in all kinds of angles. And you can look at the resurrection in all kinds of angles. What happens if Christ is not risen? We've been liars because we said God raised him from the dead. We have nothing to preach. It's all emptiness. It's muck and emptiness. And your faith, it's all nothing. And your sins haven't been taken care of. It's tempting, look. It's tempting to say that, that sins were taken care of by the death of Christ. End of story. That's not true. If there's no resurrection, Paul says, there's no forgiveness of sins. If Christ didn't rise, you were not forgiven. The death of Christ is in order to deal with sin, but it's not alone. You can't preach the gospel of the cross of Christ without the resurrection. And even when it's not mentioned in the places where it speaks of the death of Christ for reconciliation or whatever, there's always, there's always involved without it being spelled out the resurrection of Christ. Romans 4 <clears throat> Verse 25, he speaks of Christ being given for our 425 of Romans, given for our transgressions, and he was raised for our justification. If there's no resurrection of Christ, there is no forgiveness. There's no justification. The two of them go together. All kinds of things fold. The whole Christian faith turns out to be a scam. He says, you are still in your sins. 18. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ. If Christ has not risen from the dead, then those that have fallen asleep, who have died in Christ, have perished. This is not just theology, and, and it isn't just exegetics, and it isn't just a preaching. It means my ethel has perished. It means my daughter. It means our two sons. It means friends 
that we love as much and sometimes more than our own lives. All who gave their lives, all of those to, of whom and to whom Jesus said, if you die for my sake, you're blessed. They've all perished. And Jesus becomes a liar. Jesus becomes, at least if not a liar, someone self-conned, someone who thinks he's somebody that he's not. Everything falls apart if there is no resurrection. Now, the resurrection doesn't work without the cross. You can't leave the cross behind. If he didn't die, you can't talk about him rising from the dead. But, but it's bigger than that. The cross is bigger than that. And it's bigger than what we say. Because, and God help us. And our teachers and preachers and leaders need to be telling us this. That the cross of Christ is bigger than for the remission of sins. It's massive. It's a... It's a choice he made freely. John 10, 17 and 18. John 10, 17 and 18. Do you know why my father loves me? Because I lay down my life. What does the cross mean? Look, look at him. What are you seeing up here? You're seeing God looking at him. Earlier when he was baptized, comes up out of the water. God says, for Christ's uh, purpose, as well as the hearers, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And he said it to Christ. Mark and Luke will address Jesus. You are my beloved son. Yes? What? He said that about him. I love him. Now on the cross, Jesus said, Do you know why my father loves me? Because I do this. I lay down my life. But that's not where he ends in 10, 17 of John. He said, My father loves me because I lay down my life that I might Take it again. He doesn't die just to die. He dies with a view of rising. The resurrection without the cross doesn't work. The cross without the resurrection doesn't work. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all go their own way about telling Christ from the different angles how he lived in the flesh. But they all end the same way with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your Gospel and mine is not the worship of death or a dying person. Your gospel and mine, the only gospel there is, the only gospel the Old Testament scriptures foresaw and led us to Galatians chapter 3. The law was a pedagogue to bring us to Christ. And now that we've got Christ, the pedagogue we don't need. Uh -huh. uh. The resurrection. The resurrection is a moment, a resurrection to immortality and then to glorification. It's a moment of absolute joy. And the Christians who are told over and over and over and over again the death of Christ and how sad it is and look what we did to him. They should be saying that kind of thing, of course, but not ceaselessly. The end of the story is a woman going to a tomb looking 
for a dead Christ so that she can do him the honor of, you know, clothing and whatever anointing and the like. And he wasn't there. Praise God. If she had found him, we'd all be in trouble, wouldn't we? He was like, then she turned around asking, where, where, you know, and she sees this fellow and says, are you the gardener? No, I'm not the gardener. And then he says, Mary. Of course, she thinks it's like Lazarus, back to business as usual. And she grabs him and he says, oh, don't do that. Don't hang on to me. I'm not back business as usual. The flesh relationship has ended. I'm going to send to my father and be glorified, put to death in flesh. First Peter 3, verse 18. First Peter 3, verse 18. Put to death in flesh, made alive in spirit. Second Corinthians 13, verse 4. Crucified in weakness, raised in power. Christ on the cross is doing all kinds of things. He's saying goodbye to the fleshly experience, the daz of his flesh, of which the Hebrew writer speaks in chapter what? 5 verse 7, I think. Who in the daz of his flesh prayed to his father with strong crying and tears, that kind of thing. He, he says to his mother, Mother, that's your son. Son, that's your mother. The fleshly relationship, that is the relationship as a mortal, has ended. He is now immortal and will ascend to the Father for the glorification, at which point he comes back in and as the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit being Christ's spirit. Yeah? So, and then he meets a couple of fellas, a couple of women, pardon me, and he says on the day of resurrection, he says, good morning. He uses the word karate. It means a lot of things. It means, hello, how are you? Have a great day. It means all those things in speech and Aramaic and Greek, those things. But he's, it's morning time when he's saying it, so it's best rendered. Good morning. If there ever, ever was a good morning, that was good morning. It's if five more minutes. Good, Jim, thank five you. more minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to say five more. I was going to say what he just said. He said, good morning. If there ever was a good morning, that was it. If that wasn't a good morning, there never has been, nor can there be, nor will there ever be a good morning morning. And it was a good morning, not because Pilate fainted dead in his soup. Not, not the whole economy changed and everybody had a job. Not because Tiberius over in the island of Capri went all, you know, not, none of that. It was a good morning because Christ rose and defeated sin, for sin reigned, Romans 5.21, Romans 5.21, sin reigned as king, reigned through death. And in defeating death, Christ says, the usurper king has been kicked off his throne. Sin is defeated in the resurrection. Ah, yeah. Then he says, back at 15, 
1 Corinthians 15. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men the most pity pitiable. He says, do you know, you know, you know the group that has been conned worse than anybody on the planet? If Christ isn't written, risen, us. If in Christ, only in this life, we have some kind of hope, we're of all the people in the world to be pitied. Well, above everybody else. And then he says, he's had enough of that. He's had enough of the hypothetical. He says, but now, and he can't take any more of that other garbage. He says, but now is Christ risen. So what? So if Christ is not risen, here is what follows. You have nothing to preach. You have nothing to believe. You have nothing to hope. The word peace this that I read earlier, it sounds like he repeat, repeated the same phrase. But peace this, while it's distinct from the word help us, it often means hope. Should have been rendered hope there. He said, if Christ is not raised, what? You have nothing to preach. You have nothing to believe. You have nothing to hope, nothing about it. You're still in your sins. We have been liars and saying God raised him from the dead. Mm. But Christ is risen. Therefore, what? We have something to preach. <laughs> We have something to preach. We have something to believe. We have something to hope. Our sins have been dealt with, annulled. They cannot sever us from the Lord Jesus Christ in whom and with whom we have both died and been raised by faith. To kill us by sin would mean you have to kill Christ again. And none of that works. Now Christ is risen. You've got something to preach. You've got something to believe. You've got something to hope. Your sins have been taken care of. You are not to be pitied. You are to be envied. Jesus came to the apostolic group after he talked to a crowd. He came to the apostolic group and he says to them, you know, and well, he thanks his father about open the eyes of all the babies. And he says to them, do you realize that wise men, kings, prophets, all the people down the ages have longed to see what you see and hear what you hear and never got it, but you did. What does that mean? Well, it means the, what the words say, but what's the significance of it? Not only to them, to you, you. Not them, true, but not them, you. If he was saying it audibly right now, you'd hear him whispered in your ear. Wise men, prophets, kings, conquerors, anybody I want to get, the, you know, the, this, that, and the other. They didn't get it. But you did. You know what you are? You're the envy of the ages. You feel that? You feel that? You're the envy of the ages. You. You who think nothing of yourself. You. You look in a mirror and every now and you're disgusted. 
Every now and again, you think of this out there, you learn, oh, I'm fed up with you. Why don't you grow up all of that kind of stuff? It's all right. I'm not saying it's all right, but it's all right that you don't exalt yourself. But it's not all right where you, and, and, and this is hard to say in case I say it wrong. It's not all right to hear him say that to you and say, he's wrong. He's wrong because I'm an absolute loser and I know nothing and this, that, and the other. And he would say, nobody's a loser in me. If you know me, you've come to know what men throughout the ages, philosophers, scientists, this is, this is, name a bunch of big scientists that you can, th Steven Weinberg, Michio Kaku, Albert Einstein. What? Name them all. They never got it. You did. You are the envy of the ages. If God hadn't raised Christ from the dead, he would have been faithless and not worthy of worship. For Christ said, he's going to raise me up. Acts chapter 2, I saw the Lord at my right hand. I saw him before my face. He is at my right hand. I will not be moved. You will not. Leave my soul in the realm of the dead, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. All of that he believed. And that's why he went to the cross, because he trusted his Father, and if God never did it for him, he's not worth believing. But now is Christ risen and exalted by the Father. Holy Father, we thank you that it's true. It is true. Even when we, in our worst moments, in our hurt moments, in our, our dying in a mouth moments, for one reason or another, we're, we're just little humans, and we're utterly dependent on you. But we believe it's true, even in the middle of our, uh, our sighs and our hurts and our confusions. How happy we are that you are who you are, and that you are our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. All may unmute now. All may unmute. Frank, resurrection looking pretty good from where you are. Yeah, we didn't get to the part about the immortal, uh, incorruptible body yet, but that sounds pretty good to me. I don't know what 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 all else is going to be involved, but that part sounds really good to me. Uh, mm -hmm. But real quick, Jim, I I I'm, I don't know if we discussed this or not uh, earlier in the evening, but. Uh, part of 15, isn't that where he talks about uh, if Christ is not raised, we're of, mo of all men to be most pitied, mm -hmm. and we might as well get after whatever we're going to get after, because that's all we're going to get. Uh, and I was thinking about, uh, I hear people, and our, even our brethren sometimes, uh, try to reword or, or use uh, Pascal's religious wager uh, in some way. And uh, I think to myself, boy, you wouldn't have sold that. Oh. You phrase. Yeah, give him a couple seconds. Prosa, but never oh. speechless. Here we go. Amen. <laughs> Frank, you're li alive again. Yes. I don't know where I froze at what point, but uh, I just said Paul would have a 
an awful hard time with uh, Pascal's religious wager. Uh, if if Paul would say if what you believe as an atheist or whatever is true, then there is no uh, there isn't that that idea uh, just doesn't cut it doesn't work. Because Paul says you, you might have if the resurrection is the reality, you might as well get what you can get while you can get it in this life in the flesh in that section right there is that pascal is that what you're saying blaze yeah blaze pascal well pascal says it could be right or wrong your best bet is to bet on that being right but <laughs> i think you're right i think you're right paul would say oh give my head peace i have <laughs> seen him yeah. we have seen him sure mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. I think you're right. Is this the one that with the heart, the cross shape, the hole in the heart? It's the same guy. That's a different. That's a different mm -hmm. quotation from. Uh, there's a God-shaped vacuum in, inside the heart of every man. Mm -hmm. That was from his uh, book called Pense. Oh, okay. Yeah, thoughts is what it means, thoughts. Joe Krill, you've been very quiet. I've got about five things. First of group hugs. <laughs> group okay, hugs. down to four, down to four now. Okay. <laughs> uh, and it just made sense with free will, God giving us free will, is he had free will to love us, and Christ had free will to give himself for us. So I, I, I think I understand where free will came from in that sense. And um, I'm going to be light and polite on this one. Uh, I think the greatest thing of birth of Christ is that he was born into the flesh and into weakness. We're born into the flesh and weakness but we are raised with him in power. Mm. Very good. Mm. Sown, in, sown in weakness, raised in power, Joe? Yes. Boy, that's that whole chapter, isn't it? That's, yeah. Mm -hmm. I like, uh, Jim, I like what you said about uh, uh, died in the flesh, being specific about in the flesh. The first but, Peter. The uh, flesh, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's. And then I, he opens it up for all for all of humanity, sown in weakness. Yeah, yeah and, that's good. And the other thing I was thinking of was, if the Jewish people understand the sacrifice of Isaac uh, by Abraham, why can't they understand the resurrection of Christ? Mm. Many Jews do. <clears throat> yeah. There are many do. Jews that do. Some Jews do. Speaking. Yeah. Um, this isn't the place to, we're not doing it right now, maybe another time. But I, see, this is true. Jesus Christ, his person I'm talking about, is the end of the world. Uh -huh. The end oh. of the world. <laughs> yeah. And he's the oh big you know, uh, new creation. He says, here's how the world ends. If you're in mm. the Christ, of course, you know, it, it all, you know, that's it, the glory and all that. If you reject the Lord Jesus Christ, you end. Mm. Right. This Jesus himself. If you had seen him walk down the street, he'd be in the flesh, and so he wouldn't, we wouldn't say it of that point. He is to be in the flesh. He was intended to be in the flesh, but then he says goodbye to the flesh and he ends it. And he isn't in the flesh anymore. He's human. 
but he's glorified human. Mm -hmm. He doesn't lose humanity. He's the glorified human. And if we could see him now as the glorified human, knowing that he is the one that, who is the Christ, he would say, I am how the world ends. It's beautiful. Love it. And the uh, yeah. other thing I have is <laughs> it's hard <laughs> to see your loved ones and friends and such that who do understand but are like um uh who's the one that said he's almost persuaded but they don't he didn't come off like the punches. <laughs> Agri if they see Agri her. Agrippa in 26, yeah. Yeah, yeah Herod Agrippa. And he says, I see it, but I don't want it. And, and you go, why? I tend to I tend to read that with a with a crooked eye in the thinking yeah. maybe, maybe he didn't see it. Maybe he's being a little sarcastic there. Uh well, I mean yes. When we see people that we care about, and even strangers we don't know, and mm -hmm. you see how good, decent, and honorable they are, mm -hmm. and you're going, yes, I've preached, I've helped them, but they say, yeah, I, I see it, but I don't want it. And it's like, why do you want to be lost? Why do you want damnation? <laughs> Then do they really see it, Joe? True. I've never, yeah, I've never talked with anybody that. that. I've never talked with anybody that that didn't see it, that didn't want it. Mm. Never. I kind of have, but I agree with what you're saying, Nancy. Is do they fully 100 percent see it? Maybe they see it 99.9. .9. Well, you may be, you may be a seed planter. You, you don't know what happens down the road. You sure. may be a seed planter. It may not be your job, you know, mm. to see the end of that discussion or the end of their life mm. or the end True. of their walk with God. Mm. You know, some people, you know, you may not see the whole, their whole journey. So I, I don't, don't discount what you, you plant mm -mm. because, you know, a, a seed was planted somewhere for other people. So I think you, you have to plant a seed. You have to you know, you, you teach, but you can't force conversion. Correct. Conversion happens in a heart. So, you know, if mm. you're looking for, okay, I've, I've shown you this. Now you got to do it. You know, I, no. I, I don't. You, well, you know, I didn't mean people, to come off that way, but you well, know. But yeah. I'm just saying you, your job may be to, you know, to plant the seed of, of that, especially if they come from a totally different, you know, background. I'm somebody, just saying. So somebody plants seed, somebody waters seed. And exactly. God, God is the harvest. Gives the increase. Exactly. The increase. So, so, but exactly. Then God exactly. when God where I see it, God plants the seed. He is the harvester. Where the water Water well, I I think you can plant a seed. I mean, you plant seed. I've had people planted seeds in my head before. <laughs> Frank Lott, <laughs> Jim McGuigan, yeah. yeah, few people. Sure, Joe. But I think Joe, yeah. another point here. Don't don't in your mind dismiss them as lost. No, because mm, sure. you don't know. You don't know they're not at the end of their journey yet and right. it's not even christ wouldn't condemn anybody right. he, no. it's it's the sin that condemns them and we just offer them hope we right. offer them god's word over and over at every opportunity right you don't beat no. them over the head with it no. but you let the no. spirit work okay. over them exactly and, and it goes back to what i was talking about free will and I'm forgetting what I was saying about free will. Damn, does free I'm will sorry. does free will necessarily mean that uh, you choose something? You're going to choose it. Yeah, you choose it, and sometimes 
I can hear things from Frank that I can't hear from someone else. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because of the relationship. That's Absolutely. But yeah, but yep. in that God through us. Plant yes. Seed. It so is. It I is. I would go back saying God is the planter of the seed, but through uh, people being friends with each other. Oh, yeah. Ordinary yeah. We definitely are to be carrying the gospel and and teaching and. And Jim, this is basic to what your lesson was tonight. Yeah. But, but we, um, but yeah, definitely. Now I got a question. <laughs> is that Joey Tilton or who's Hosea Tilton? It says Josiah. Is it Joey? It's pronounced Josiah. Oh, hi, Josiah. Hi, Joey. Hi. Hey. Beautiful, Joey. Glad you could join us. Absolutely. Hey, I've got a question for Jim, if we still have time. Is yes, we do. Us? Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Okay. Jim, can you tell us about uh, the Acts 2 statement that um, God will not allow me or not let me see decay or destruction? What is that decay or destruction? Mm. And how and and how, if at all, would that relate to any ideas of penal substitution? Oof. <laughs> mm. Or if you don't want to answer that. Great question. Uh, mm. I'm not interested in penal substitution. Okay. I don't know how that works then. Uh, that that is so. Um, later in the book of Acts, um, Paul will say that Christ, God raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. Mm. So that means that Christ, in some sense, did experience corruption. And which which mm. makes us which makes us should make us to be more careful about how we work with specific words. Christ did experience corruption in the sense that he entered into the realm of the dead, which is what was characterized as corruption. But Paul will say in 13, God raised him out of that, the realm of the dead, where everybody falls apart, so to speak. No more to return the corruption. So, um, an interesting little, looks like yeah. a disaster. there's nothing wrong with it. I'm ready for less than Heather. And Bill Crow and Billy Wilson. I'm not hearing who, whatever. I'm ready it's to hear from Billy Wilson, Bill Crow, and uh, Les and Heather, and Doug. Oh, very good, Joe. Bill Crow, yeah. do you have something to share with us, please? Uh, let me see if I can unmute him. <coughs> Hold on just a minute. Mm -hmm. He's dropping in and out. Well, that's why oh, yeah. Well, how about that? In the meantime, the <coughs> Rileys. Yeah, oh, well, we're here. Uh, well, <laughs> it's just when you're going about the discussion that, I mean, Paul um, actually seen Christ and so did the, the disciples. And uh, there was 500 people seeing him at once. But our faith, we haven't seen Christ and we believe what the scripture says. And that's what the whole crux of it is. We believe he was risen from the dead without having to see him. We believe. And we are even more blessed than, than they were because they seen it and they, they seen the proof that he lived. We have it in our hearts. And that's really what, what counts. We know it from our faith in the, the scriptures and what Jesus said. And I think that surpasses it all. 
for me anyway. It's true. And that's all we want to talk about, you know, because um, I think that's all we think about all the time is talking to people and telling them about our wonderful Jesus and what, you know, who he is. Uh, my son, who's a great scientist, and he's always into formulas. And I have told them that the, the only formula I need to know is the formula for the resurrection. And only Jesus has got that. And he'll never get it <laughs> <laughs> to Jesus. <laughs> you can't find it, you know, by math mathematics or science. Mm -hmm. You have to believe. You have mm -hmm. to have faith. And that's, that's, that's the whole basis of it, your faith. You're the end. I, I just take Heather's word for it. Uh, <laughs> Go, girl. Well, I think people should know where it is. Yeah. So, first time visitor, Doug, do you want to yeah. say? Yeah. It's just one comment, uh, or it's kind of a question. Um, we're talking about the resurrection. Uh, he says, You're still in your sins. Mm. And. Um, some things I've been uh, learning or, or thinking about, um, I, want to, I want to apply that to 12, 13. Uh, by one spirit, we were all baptized in the weather, one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. Um, if he's not raised from the dead, there are Jews and Greeks. If he's not raised from the dead, oh. then there are free and slaves. Mm. Because if he's not raised from the dead, there's no creation. The world is as it is. In all of That's, That's very great. good. Thank That's you. That's great. Wow. Hey, we got Doug on all, the all right, Doug. Hey, that'll preach, Charlie. Yeah, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, my goodness. Yeah, we great, got, Doug. Thank you. We have a new speaker whenever we need one. Doug. Bill Crow. But Bill Crow, what? Where, where'd he go? Yeah, he's yeah, he's jumping out. Yeah, he's having difficulties. I don't know. Yeah, you would look at the you would look at the news and see the world. Well, that's what the world thinks, uh, Doug. That's that's what the world. That's what they say, don't they? That's what how they view things. Why? Right? With the resurrection, no resurrection. This is how it is. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. And um, and then look what happened in the light of that. Thank you for that reminder. In Galatians three twenty six. That's powerful. You're all very powerful God by faith, because as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is therefore baptism becomes profoundly important. It denounces everything that divides people, you know, women against men, rich against poor, and all of that. Thank you, Doug. Love you, Doug. Power. Hey, hey, Doug, do I have to be baptized? <laughs> <laughs> Did someone ask a question? Yeah, somebody asked me that. Do I have to be yeah. baptized? Well, yeah, that's that's because we um, we all limit salvation to something really small. Uh, first of all, we, <laughs> we we related only to me. Yeah, he's, oh, my man. he's my personal savior, like he's my personal trainer at the gym. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, You've been doing uh, some thinking, brother. The the sins, um, they're just my sins, okay? And uh, <laughs> so it doesn't reach that level where you talked about the world. Okay. It, it, it's it's yeah. it's it's a it's a fruit of the enlightenment, which emphasized the freedom of the individual. And so um like even in, in my Bible, I, I'm in the habit now of uh, changing you. This is a this is a plus of the new of the old American standard and the King mm. James, and that is that the you there is either ye or thou, so you know whether he's speaking to a, a group of people oh. or 
a single individual. And in the New Testament, most of all, it's you plural. So I understand that there's a Texas edition of the Bible, Jim, that says y'all. Whenever you, get, whenever, you get the, <laughs> whenever you get the plural you, you know. So and there's there is a place somewhere, I can't remember, it's one of Paul's writings where he actually says you all. Okay. all. Two, two different Greek words. <laughs> you plural all. And uh I've uh, learned that, there, uh. that there's not a wasted word in all. So when he says oh, man. when he says you all. He's reminding the you, the plural, that um, this is not just individuals. It's, it is all of you. Um, so salvation happens to individuals, but it's for the purpose, the corporate purpose, the body of Christ. And, and that's, I mean, and, and that's worked against by everything we see. Um, yeah. In, in the world. Yeah. In the world we have right now. So. My question has always been to people who made such a statement, you know, do I have to be baptized? I said, uh, why wouldn't you want to? Why? Why not? Why? Do you see all these things that go, go along with this? Do you see all these people hearing it for the first time? Why wouldn't you be, be a part of everything, the cosmic aspect of baptism? Why wouldn't you be a part of the pro, pro, proclaiming aspect and let the world know this is where I stand? And uh, yeah. Hey, Frank, can you mention something about the Enlightenment, please? The what? You've talked the Enlightenment. You've talked to me about it. Yeah. Oh, well, it's we live in the Western culture that is all about. Uh, the individual and me and all that kind of thing. And it's interesting, scriptures never used, or New Testament never talks about a personal savior at all. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's interesting. Uh, talks about our God and, and our, our Lord and Savior and all that, but never uh, my personal savior. Uh, so that's something that uh, years ago, Tom T. Hall uh, wrote a song <laughs> uh, and it went, me and Jesus got our own thing going. Me and Jesus got it all worked out. Me and Jesus got our own thing going and we don't need anybody to tell us what it's all about. <laughs> and if you see today, people talk about being spiritual but not being Jesus and, and uh, things like that. So uh, that's, you know, you can, you can lead people to uh, the fountain of knowledge. And, uh, but some people go there and just rinse and spit. Uh, <laughs> others drink and benefit from it. Galatians 2.20, Christ who loved me and gave himself for me. Yeah. 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 It's personal, sure. It's not just personal. Uh, I, and we look at the example that God and Christ give as Christ being the husband and the church being the bride. And we can look at husband and wife earthly. And you're one together, but yet you're separate within that oneness. Mm. I'm saying you're an individual, they're an individual, but you came together as a decision to be one together. And we have came to Christ to be part of the bride, the church. And say we want to live God in Christ as their bride, and as a husband. Don't say uh, the Ephesian part about the husband and wife. It's not the husband wanting their thing. They'll die for the wife, and the wife will die for the husband. And it makes it so much better when they're trying to 
live for the other one instead of live just for those shows. And that's why we probably have so many divorces because he <laughs> wants their own thing. And it was just a quick, oh, yeah, we love each other. Let's get married. And then can find out they didn't really take the time to see if they truly loved each other. Uh, hey, Jack. Hey, uh, Jack, can you say something, Jack? Hey, Jack Ray. Jack Ray, please. Hi there, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi, yes, Jack. sir. Hi. I'll tell you what. The only thing I know, and I don't know a lot, there is no resurrection. Um, then uh, I've wasted a lot of time in my life worrying about things that don't exist. There is a resurrection, and I'm excited about it. And I appreciate your, I appreciate the talk tonight. That's that's an awesome passage, and it means the world to us that there is a, was. Amen. Love you, Jack. How about Billy? Love y'all. Where are you from, Jack? Um, right Billy now, Wilson, anything? Norman, Oklahoma, but right now I'm still at the Foster's home for children in Stephenville. <laughs> right. And uh, so we're, we're still working at the Foster's home, and it's, it's difficult, but we love it. Hey, is Billy, God bless Billy, you. Billy, yeah, Billy we Wilson. Honor we honor you for that, Jack. I honor you very much. Did that for a long time. God is good. God a plural a plural unity can i just real quick say uh i understand what joe was saying but i think the real problem in that particular passage is that we don't recognize who god is uh because the the very fact that we're told that just like God is the head of the uh, is the head and Jesus is the uh, uh, is in subjection to Him and so is the Spirit in subjection to Christ. That that is telling us that this is how the Godhead is. This is the characteristic of who God is. And mutual subjection, mutual submission uh, is who God is. And that's mm. who we're called to be uh, because that's who he is. Oh, that, I Frank. Think, I think Allie was trying to say something. Sorry. Lynn, Lynn always uh, used to teach and say that Okay. Allie, get get Allie, get right in front of your computer and up close and right in the middle of it. Salvation wasn't, it, it is individual, but it, but it is in community. We are saved in community. We are saved individually, but we are not saved apart from community. We're baptized and then we're added to the church. It took me a while to process that in my mind, but I think he was exactly right. And I think it's it's in that that we exemplify being in the image of God like you were talking about there, Frank. Um, our submission to one another. And uh, there's so many people that I'm aware of who think that they can worship on their own, uh, be apart from a, from a congregation, they're missing something that's very vital that God, that God intended for them. I'm not going to say they can't be saved. That's not my place. Mm -hmm. but, but I think they're missing something that is very fundamental. Hey, Allie. I'm thinking, uh, you know, we're called to be servants, and if we don't go uh, or online or how uh, uh, work with the brothers and sisters, we're not being servants. We're back to that spiritualism, as Frank was saying, is if it ain't fitting for me, I'll still believe in God, but if it ain't fitting me, I'll just say I'm spiritual uh, instead of saying, oh. 
there's something I might need to relook at this. I'm supposed to be a part of a body, and I'm supposed to be helping brothers and sisters, and they're <laughs> helping me, and I'm missing out, getting help by them, and they're missing out by me. <clears throat> I, I want to just go back quickly to somebody's comment about, they said, you know, um, people say, do I have to be baptized? Mm -hmm. That might have been Frank's or whatever. Maybe the right answer would be, did Jesus have to die? Mm. Because mm. that's what baptism is. It's a burial. Did he, did he have to die? Or, mm. you know, and burial, burials mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15. Mm -hmm. He died according to the scriptures. Oh. He was buried and he was raised according to the scriptures. And if you don't want to be baptized, maybe you don't want to die. <clears throat> and maybe and you yeah. don't want to be raised a new person. And yes. Well, yeah. Uh, people, good. some people don't want to be called up. What's wrong with just I don't, saying I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to come up to the demands that are being made on me. Nor do I want somebody to demand more than I'm ready to give right now. So my answer is no. I don't want to go there, for whatever reason. Have, but. But that's uh, that, like I said, maybe that's part of their journey at the time. You can't. Yes. I mean, yes sure. Listen, I, I know pe plenty of people in my lifetime who got wet, I believe, because huh. it was kind of pushed yeah. on them to say, OK, I'll be baptized. But was it like a conversion of their heart? I, I don't think so, because they're still not they're still not act, you know. I'm not, I'm not trying to judge the people. I'm not trying to say that, but I think sometimes you, you, you know, you've seen people where, you know, they've been caught up in a moment, you know, conversion is a conversion of the heart. You know, mm. I was raised in the church. So, you know, people got baptized, you know, you see a whole group of teenagers get baptized at the same time. You think they were all converted at the heart at the same time? I mean, really, you know, mm. conversion happens in a heart. You know, I'm not saying it didn't. I don't know. I can't speak to that. But mm -hmm. conversion happens yeah. in a heart. And also is your baptism is an outward sign of your heart and what you're willing to, you know, say, hey, this is. So I think sometimes we need to understand that, OK, maybe they want to process that more because they weren't maybe raised in the church or understand what this all is meaning. Because maybe I'm going to have to, you know, some people think they have to change their whole life. They don't realize it's a work in progress. It's a journey, yeah. you know, because uh, of how it's presented. It's a journey for all of us. And it goes and back. So I think we have to take a step back and say, hey, it's a journey. It's a process for all of us. You don't have to have your ducks in a row. So <laughs> I don't mean to be preachy or anything. And But I think sometimes we just, we kind of push when maybe we should take a step back and look at it from their point of view. Cause I've, there have been people that have resisted and, you know, if you just, I think, take a look at it from where they're at, then you can understand, Hey, your ducks don't have to be in a row cause yeah. mine ain't in a row and I'm 61 years old and they pray, but like, they're never going to be in a row because mm. that's why Jesus died. Cause my ducks ain't never going to be in a row. <laughs> so they think, you know, they look at people and they say, hey, you live a good life or you do good things or, you, you know, you do this or that, that you have to be a certain way. No, look, we're all on a journey. You know, I may be further along. I may be less further along. You may be better than me. But, you know, Jesus is the answer for all of us. So, I mean, that's that's the big thing. So I think we just have to keep that in mind. You know, yeah, Nancy. What I'm also, yeah. I'm going to bring in uh, more of a physical down to earth and kind of maybe secular, but the husband and wife, you know, I think husbands and wife, you know, are go the same long way before they get married, but we have a lot of people that don't pay attention and say, do I really want to be with this person? Can I okay. be with this person? Well, Joe, I've had people that tell me this. I've had a wife that tell me that's told me I love him more as a brother in Christ than I do as my husband. 
even though he's done this, this, and this to me, mm -hmm. and I can, I can by scripture divorce him. By scripture, I can divorce okay. him. Yeah. But I love him more as a brother in Christ. And if I divorce him, I'm relatively sure he's going to leave the church. And church. I don't know that he'll ever come back. And yeah. I'm more concerned about his soul than I am about what he's done to me. Okay, but mm -hmm. Nancy, that's not where I'm at. I'm okay. talking about before marriage. Well, well that Joel, matter. that's everywhere. I mean, you're going to find that everywhere. And there are going to be people that have broken marriages in the church, but you can't, oh, yeah. you know, you can't fix that. That's that's life, brother. That's the journey. Yeah. And but you I, have to I, dive up from where they're at. Yeah, but what you're saying is I agree. I was making an example like you were saying. Yeah. Where all in different levels and different steps. Exactly. All right, Joe. Let's hold. Let's hold it right there. We don't yeah. want to open this. To Mariana. No. I just want to ask Jim if you're going to go further into this chapter, please. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Lord, yeah. Lord, I, name I, please, please don't stop there. Okay. Yes. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can't go. You can't go deep enough, brother. <clears throat> He won't. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> if Jim says he's going to do it, Jim does it. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. I, I, can, I, uh, can rest, I can rest tonight better if you promise to. If you say you're going to go deeper into 15. Yeah, that's great. Hey, Billy Wilson, any word, just hello or uh, like the topic, uh, like the chapter, anything on that? Well, there's um, there's some there's some music that I listen to. Uh, I listen to a lot of music. Some of it's just to pass the time while I chop up. Wood. Sure. But there's other mu music like uh, uh, when I hear it, like uh, the Beach Boys' "Good Vibrations," the production. Oh yeah. For the time, uh, McCartney's yesterday, uh, Harrison's My Sweet Lord for uh, melodic value. Yes. Uh, Harry Seacombe's If I Ruled the World. <laughs> um, <laughs> Robert Palmer's Every Kind of People. That, that when I hear those songs, I, it's not just music. It makes me want to pick up the guitar and write. Because mm. there's something, there's just something happening that's different. Mm. You're not just listening; you're being inspired. <clears throat> I've never bought a ticket to listen to Jim McGuigan where I didn't want to go away <laughs> and sit down and write. And and the song that he sang tonight, if yeah, if if this is not. If you're not going to bed tonight with the court, well, it should have been the chorus. I'm kind of, <laughs> once he said it as the climax, I kind of thought to myself, that's a climax. That could have been a chorus. And, yeah. and, and the words were, you're the envy of the ages. The ages. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear God, what a truth. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and Im immediately, immediately, I, I want to grab the guitar. I want to, oh, I want to nice. sit down. The envy of the age is that truth of all the greats, of all the beauty of the earth, of all the animals, of all the stars, of everything that existed. Here we are, a little group of nobodies, like not unlike a living, ordinary, uneducated man. And yet God points to them and says, You're the envy of the ages. Hey, Billy. Hey, Billy. What a, if, if, if you didn't Let him go, get, Joe. If you didn't catch that tonight, the you're a deaf. Power of that. You need yeah. to hear it again. You need to hear it again. Yes. Um, the only thing that was wrong with it is you only said it once, Jim. <laughs> it should, should have been a chorus. <laughs> musically, musically oh speaking. man the verses were brilliant the climax was great but the climax was the chorus it, it thrilled me it, it, and every time I buy a ticket to listen to them that, that there's that one thing that just 
it, it's not that I heard something good. It's now that I want to say something good. <clears throat> well, Billy, in that song, add to it, <clears throat> the sad part is that we are to be pitied more than all men if we don't pay attention to that and if that's all mm. we have. Yeah. Yeah. It's a resurrection isn't reality. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. are we doing? Yeah. Yeah. And we can also thank you of the hymnal, uh, If That Ain't Love. <laughs> Just scold yeah. the Krells for not telling me about this group sooner. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe well. they're trying, trying to keep it to themselves. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I love they Bill blew it. Family. They blew it, Doug. They totally blew it. <clears throat> they, they actually had the courage to come to Pennsylvania twice oh. and, and, and to the same church. Oh, <laughs> gee. Wow. They need purple hearts for that. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Doug, will you tell people, tell people about this and give them my email? Will you please? Okay. Sure. Sure. And, and you like it. So you want us, we're here for whoever. That's why we're, yeah. That's what energizes the group, I think. Absolutely. Thank you, Jim. Mm. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. So yeah, next week, next week, next week we're off, and then Billy, you're gonna have the mic the whole time. Yeah, you can sing us a song. And yeah, uh, Kevin, Kevin. Absolutely. I've got. I've got a in, in I, fact, I, I got a funny idea. I got a great idea to preach for you in a couple of weeks. It's called Excellent. The Envy of the Ages. I don't know if you've heard that. <laughs> like it. All right. Probably from oh, yeah. 15. Nice. nice. Yeah. Hey, Frank yeah. and Kevin. Uh, I know Frank was there Sunday with Coleraine. It, are you guys still working on thinking about moving into Saturday so Corrine can come in? Yeah, we're trying to get them to come across to sail with us. Yep. Okay. So yeah, we're working on it. Also, though, we're also trying to get a commitment from uh, you know those of them who would commit to trying to be there as opposed to oh okay you know that's worth. So yeah. that's why we chose the one, the twelve or one o'clock time on Saturday. There you go. Because it would be six or seven. Okay, four. and that'd be first of the year. Are you? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, around that. Time. Yeah, we want to open it up for them. We really, they've uh, met a great deal to us, and vice versa. And it would be great just to so, and we would bring meet it on all Saturday together. Instead. Yes, we would. We meet on Saturday at, at noon or one. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be yeah. a lot better for me too. Cool. Yeah, good, good. Well, that's awesome. already a positive. Excellent. And I think it'd be good for me if my job situation comes out positive. I hope so, Joe. I hope you're still trying. You still trying? Yep. Yeah, good. Love library? Yeah, the library. I still haven't heard. Good. Of You'd be so good at that, Joe. You really would be, man. I still would you love just, to see oh. him. I still would love to take a tour of Jim's library. <laughs> oh, man. Thank you, Jim. God bless you all. God bless you all. You. Oh, Thanks, Merry Dan. Christmas, everything. Yeah. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. So we won't see you. Keep praying for Frank. Love you all. Yeah. Absolutely. Frank. Bye. Merry Merry Christmas. Christmas. Okay. Bye. Have a good week. Absolutely. God bless you all. Bye. Thank you very much. Good night.